I was studying first John not too long ago. And the thing that really stood out was that there's nothing that will make you feel further apart from God than unconfessed sin. What's up, party people? Brad Large here with Reclaim Reformation, where we help uh, husbands, fathers, and men reclaim their faith and really understand the various ways in which the Christian tradition that they grew up in can equip them to make a kingdom difference in their vocations, in their families, in their churches. And one of the really critical moments in my walk with Christ was this idea of understanding, confessing, and repenting. I know it's kind of silly, but um, I grew up, and this wasn't really stressed in the Protestant tradition. I grew up Baptist. It wasn't really stressed. In fact, the Baptist tradition, they have, you know, a credo Baptist position, so people grow up, and they confess all their sins, and they're forgiven. And it's a wonderful thing to be baptized and forgiven, and, and I believe that that is, that's a positive thing, that we confess our sins, and that at that moment that we die with Jesus, we are resurrected with Jesus in baptism, and we are, we're saved. We, we become a Christian, and our, all our sins are forgiven. But I think that as Protestants, we don't look at the impact of confessing and repenting sin on a daily basis basis. And so we misunderstand that. We kind of think it's like a Catholic thing or an Eastern Orthodox thing, and we don't take it as seriously, I think. There are many instances in the Bible where it talks about how our unconfessed sin creates distance between us and God. It creates an inseparable barrier. We have to be forgiven of our sins before we can approach God. And I think that it's part of the constant evaluation of our life to see whether we are walking with Christ or not is, are we being sanctified? Are we producing spiritual fruit? And that's really hard to do if we have a heart cluttered up with unconfessed sin. And so these are three ways I think people get confessing and repenting wrong. So I think the first barrier to a lot of Christians these days, um, 65% of Christians don't think that they need to go to church. A large percentage of Christians don't read their Bibles regularly. And so they're getting God's word secondhand, either through sermons or devotionals on version or something like that. And so they don't really, uh, they're not really striving to understand God's commands and God's word. And so they're not as convicted about what God calls sin. There are a lot of Christians that believe that we're not under the law at all anymore, that we are not called to obey God's commands in any way. But that's simply not true. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And even though we are not beholden to sin and we are forgiven of sin, uh, God still tells us there are right ways to live. And so understanding how the commandments that God gave us and the commandments that Jesus gave us, Jesus even says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. While obeying the law is not a way for us to be saved, once we're saved, there is a desire for us to show appreciation and gratitude for the gift that we've been given. And that's the spiritual fruit that is talked about. So the problem then becomes uh, for Christians is that they, they don't know what to confess. Anger, lust, anxiety, these are sins that we need to confess to God. Now, I'm not saying don't get help or don't take medicine for uh, mental illness or anything like that. Or Mental health is, is very important. I believe that God blesses us with medicine and different things that can help us with that, but it's still at the core a sin, and we should be talking to God about it first. John MacArthur got into a bunch of hot water about that recently, but even understanding how we're not posturing ourselves correctly before God and getting anxious or depressed or angry or, you know, having feelings of lust, these are all indicators that we have unconfessed sin in our life and that we need to turn over to God. So even knowing what God calls sin is our first step in being able to confess it. I think the second mistake is that people don't know how to repent. We are not beholden to sin. The Apostle Paul talks about this a lot, that we don't continue to sin so that grace may abound. We need to take that seriously. We are not held down by death and sin any longer. Jesus has freed us from that. Now, any Christian is not going to wake up and go, oh, you know what? As soon as I became a Christian, I was perfect. That's not how it works. But the process of sanctification is a process of acknowledging what God calls sin and then turning that over to God so that he can transform it into something good, so that he can take our sin and help us become transformed more into the image of Christ. And so while we recognize what God calls sin, then we have to start repenting of it. And that starts with confession, but then it's also 
uh, repenting is taking that call to, to transformation seriously. When we don't repent, what ends up happening is that we end up feeling helpless. We end up feeling trapped. So many Christians don't know what God calls sin. And then when they do start to confess, they, they don't take the repenting part seriously. How do I make sure that I don't continue to do this? And so there's almost a lack of responsibility there of faith versus works can be a huge issue here. Some people really question, what is my responsibility here? And we are called to strive to repent, to turn the other direction. And the third thing I think is the most surprising of the three points. They don't know how to forgive. You see, the grounding of confession and repentance is that we're doing this and then God forgives us. And it's an interesting dynamic because God reminds us in the Lord's Prayer you know, please forgive me as I forgive those who trespass against me. And so I think a lot of Christians have a centered view that I need to be forgiven. I need to confess and repent and be forgiven. But then they're not internalizing that lesson and extending that forgiveness to other people. And I think that that is an important aspect of this. We need to practice forgiveness so that we understand how to live as a forgiven person. And I know that that seems backwards, but I really think that's a huge hindrance for people. In fact, a lot of things that I see people uh, that cause a lot of angst in personal relationships is this inability to forgive other people. And that ends up causing bitterness and resentment and other things. But bitterness and resentment is like drinking a gallon of rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. Like it's, it's not going to do anything. And in fact, that bitterness and resentment is just another unconfessed sin that we have to learn how to deal with. One of the surprising benefits, I think, to confessing and repenting as a practice as well is that we want to change the world. As men, we, want, we look around, we see a lot of brokenness in the world, and we want to change it. But I think one of the most powerful things about starting with confession and repenting in our, in our own heart is that's what God calls us to do. Put our faith in Jesus Christ and turn over our burdens to him. And when we do that, I heard this from Pastor Doug Wilson, when we want to change the world, we have to start with ourself. And when we start with ourself and confessing and repenting our own sin, we realize just how patient we have to be for any change to happen, much less changing the whole world. It takes a lot of patience just to, to give ourselves over to Christ and be forgiven. And ultimately, that's the goal is to bring about the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And you don't do that by focusing on yourself right? We confess and repent for ourselves, and we do that so that we can pour ourselves into our family and acts of service for our family and our church and the world. And I think that's something that Christian men really need to focus a lot more on is putting God first. What does it look like to actually put God first and put that focus outside of ourselves? And then because of who God is, what has he given us authority and power to change in the world? And what vocation has he given us to bring about his kingdom here?